Good evening and welcome. For those of you I've not met before, my name is Anna Spooner and I am the tastings and events host here at the Wine Society, or I say here at the Wine Society, here, here in my house, but <laughs> for the Wine Society. Uh, joined behind the scenes this evening by Mahesh, who just handles up absolutely everything, all things tech. So if you do have any questions, please, uh, or any problems this evening, particularly with connectivity, making sure you can hear me, see me, see your screens, please do uh, give Mahesh a little nudge. You can do so on the chat um, by selecting tastings team from the, top, the drop down menu and Mahesh will be able to answer any questions that you might have. Uh, you can also use that chat as I can see some of you already are to talk to your fellow members. Please do make sure that when you're wanting to chat to everyone, select everyone, not just hosts and panellists. A couple of you have already used hosts and panellists, and it's just Mahesh and I that can see that. So uh, if you want everyone to see it, then please do select everyone. Uh, we will have a little bit of time for some questions. Hopefully throughout the course of the evening, I'll be able to answer them. But if not, just pop them in the Q&A um, or, or pop them in whenever you like, and hopefully we'll get to those as well. So, um, not much more to say. For anyone new to SIP size, welcome. These events are all designed to be little building blocks to increase what was just wine knowledge. This is our first non-wine SIP size. Um, so they're little, little nuggets, little building blocks. We have three examples per session normally, um, and they're 45 minutes with a bit of fun and a bit of learning along the way. Um, don't worry if you haven't got the three samples I suggested. The reason Mahesh just asked me before, why have you chosen to start the year with gin? And I said, well, actually, the whole point of sip size is if you don't have the exact uh, wines or in this case spirits, it doesn't matter. You can join in with whatever you've got at home. And I thought after Christmas and after New Year, some people might have some leftover something. So if you haven't got uh, a gin to hand, uh, but you know that there's one scurried away in the cupboard, do feel free to go to go and grab it and just sip along um, throughout the course of the evening. It doesn't have to be the perfect match to these three samples. Um, what I would say is I'm tasting them straight. Um, that always sounds a bit weird when you're tasting spirits. I'm definitely not a spirits tasting expert. I am a gin fan, um, but I even find it quite challenging to taste spirits. So I'll show you the, the techniques that I've been taught, um, but those are for tasting them as as. Uh, straight samples. If you have got tonic or if you're about to pour tonic, please, um, I mentioned in the email uh, that went out yesterday, ideally light tonic is better. Um, and the reason for that is just there's less sugar and therefore the sugar um, doesn't mark some of the flavors and aromas. So if you are um, about to pour some tonic, if you do have a lighter version or a, or a diet tonic, then those two do tend to be better for tasting you know, pleasure is a different thing, but for the tasting portion, they would be better. So without further ado, I am going to get started. Hopefully, since nobody said anything, everyone can hear me. It's a bit daunting, the first one back after after such a long break. So uh, yeah, it's the longest I've not done an online event for, gosh, nearly two, yeah, probably, yeah, nearly two years. So uh, I'm feeling a little rusty, but nothing a few gins won't, won't fix. So um, I think it's important we start with where gin originated. Now, <laughs> I, I'm going to flash up an a image in a moment, but I won't put, pop it up yet. It took Mahesh a little bit by surprise that we were going to start with that image this evening. Um, but gin as a spirit, where did it originate? Well, some say Italy. But the vast majority of people think Holland. Um, there's a reason some think Italy, and I'll come on to it in a moment when we start to talk about what makes gin gin. Um, but most people believe that, uh, and it's pretty widely believed, that Holland is the birthplace of gin. And that is particularly because there are lots of references. The first reference is in the 13th century to something called Geneva. And uh, that reference of the 13th century was in a, in a work written in Bruges. Uh, there's also a print recipe for Geneva from the 16th century, and that was a, a recipe from Antwerp. There's another reason. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll first say that juniper is the key part of 
gin. And that's where the word Geneva comes from. And that's where gin comes from. So there's sort of an evolution. We got to gin through Geneva. And then before that was the was the ingredient or the key ingredient in gin, which is the flavoring of juniper, um, be it artificial or, or infused. And we'll talk about that a bit more later. It's the base aromatic. Um, but juniper before uh, the Geneva was still being used for medicinal tonics. So lots of doctors used it. Uh, monks used it. In particular, what I found really interesting is um, in during the Black Death, the doctors would stick juniper in their masks and they thought it would protect them as they were going to, to deal with all the victims of the Black Death. So it's had a medicinal, medicinal history. Pardon me. Um, but if you wanted any more proof that Holland might be the place uh, where gin originated, um, the English soldiers, now I appreciate this isn't completely correct, but the, the, uh, this is a painting of the 80 year war. And the English soldiers helped the Dutch during the 80 year war fight the Spanish. And during that time, British soldiers uh, wrote, or English soldiers, pardon me, wrote back to say that they had been drinking Geneva to calm nerves before battle. Um, and that is actually where the phrase Dutch courage is believed to come from, from uh, the, the Dutch drinking this, this Geneva, this distilled juniper ahead of battles. So I thought, yeah, an interesting image to start the year with, but there we go. <laughs> so how did it get to England? Uh, well, um, there are a couple of reasons it's so popular in England particularly comparative to lots of other countries, we're probably the most, um, we make the widest range of gin, let's say, uh, in the UK. There are other European countries that love it too, but we certainly have the bug. Um, it was popular as an alternative to brandy. Um, the British government imposed horrible taxes on French and duties on French brandy, but they allowed unlicensed gin production. So from 1695 to the 1730s, there was what was called the gin craze. Uh, which is basically what you can see on your screens now. This is actually a picture by Hogarth. Um, on the left, you can see Beer Street. And on the right is Gin Lane, showing the two different uh, drunken types during the gin craze. This picture was actually commissioned um, by beer companies to show that beer was, a, it was basically the first, well, one of the first modern day sort of advertising scandals. Um, but there, there, it was sort of wild and people were just making unlicensed gin at home. Um, so you can imagine, quite interesting. There was a gin act, which was imposed um, on, <clears throat> pardon me, which was um, an imposed tax on the retailers to, to stop this gin craze. Um, but obviously that, that led to riots. So they abolished that act and then they reintroduced another act later, which is, I believe, still sort of in, an, in a way in, um, in use now, which was in the 1750s. Um, and that was that you have to, um, distillers have to sell to licensed retailers. They can't sell through sort of dodgy means. Um, but the reason I think this is so interesting is that actually the 80, in, during the 18th century, they produced gin using pot stills. And a lot of artisanal gin, and to be honest, a lot of the gin that all of us drink today is still produced using those pot stills with the same design. So it's lovely that it still uh, harks back to these, these traditions. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to go through a couple of flavours. We are going to talk properly about our first gin that I've selected, the East London Liquor London Dry Gin, in a moment. But if you have any gin at all, I do encourage you as we talk through these flavors and aromas that you find in gin to see if you can pick some out. Um, so flavors or, or aromas, I think at this stage, try smelling first. I don't want to have the gin craze by 7.15 on a Tuesday. So just try and see if you can smell some of these aromas. Um, the first one that you can see bang in the middle is what we've just been talking about, uh, juniper. It's the main botanical. It's part of the cypress family. Um, the reason that a lot of people think that maybe maybe gin did come from Italy is that juniper, some of the best quality juniper around is found in Tuscany and it has a long heritage of growing juniper. So 
Um, a lot of people wondered whether it could it could have originated there. If you're not sure what juniper smells like, fear not, because until um, until I started drinking gin, I wouldn't know. It's not something you cook with or eat with particularly often. Although again, in Tuscany, you you would see more of it. Um, but aroma wise. Pine is very closely associated with juniper. So if you're getting a sort of pine smell, can be slightly spicy sometimes and also sometimes some lavender as well. But for me, the real thing that sticks out about juniper is pine. And I think most gins, and you should, I'll, I'll talk, well, I'll mention it now. To be classed as a gin, you should have a dominant juniper aroma. Now, I don't think that all the gins in the world do that. I think that, that uh, a lot of people bend those rules, shall we say, but the dominance aroma should be juniper. So we talked about juniper, let's go around on a couple of the others. Um, coriander seeds. Now, hopefully some of you may have smelt coriander seeds before. I personally love cooking with coriander seeds. Also really prominent, arguably the second most prominent smell in a, in, in a lot of gins. Not all gins have to use this collection, by the way. These are the, the most common, and then I'll throw in some googlies in a minute. Um, but coriander has a sort of mellow smell to it, aroma, um, lemony, sagey. Uh, some people get a candied ginger um, aroma from coriander seeds. But for me, that lemon and sage is, is certainly, um, I love putting coriander seeds into chicken curries. And I think that's probably because I love that marriage. Um, angelica root, quite musky. And one of the reasons that angelica root is so popular is it marries the other components together. So we talk in gin about notes and you have the top notes and the, the bottom notes. But what angelica root does, a lot of distillers will tell you, is it kind of combines them and makes them more married rather than going, oh, I can only smell lemon. And then I get a weird after smell of this. It, it really, you know, that's something we talk about in wine all the time. How, you know, how integrated is everything? How integrated is the oak? How integrated are, are the tannins? Angelica root integrator, um, along with uh, orris root as well, which is not on this one, but orris root is another, uh, which is the bulb of the iris plant. And that's another aroma fixer. Citrus peel, you can use lots of different citruses. Um, and we've got two, the, our first two really do have two quite different citrus aromas. Um, you, you tend to use the peel rather than the flesh because the oils are better. Uh, cassia, often called Chinese cinnamon. Um, obviously, it looks a bit like cinnamon as well. So it's got this lovely sort of sweet uh, baking spice note to it. Um, and then I, cardamom, again, cooking that lovely um, Indian, well, not exclusively Indian, but often used in Indian cuisine. So you will probably recognize that one a little more. Um, here's some others. <laughs> um, and I'm not joking, we're going to smell a few of these this evening, uh, but there are all sorts of things. Obviously, slows is a pretty obvious one for our final, our final uh, tasting, or if you have a slow gin this evening. Um, but things like parsley or cubeb berries, which I'll explain what they smell like, because I think out of all of those, they're probably the one that you might go, oh, not sure I've come across those. Um, cubeb berries are part of the pepper family, unsurprisingly, looks a bit like pepper there. And they have aromas of lemon and eucalyptus, um, quite refreshing, actually. So less on the peppery side, um, not that sort of, uh, oh, I've forgotten the chemical of pepper now. Doesn't matter. It's Tuesday and we're all having gin, um, but it's not a classic pepper smell. It's more lemon and eucalyptus and, and that, those sorts of flavours rather and aromas rather than pepper. So with that in mind and with all of those uh, sort of unusual, should we say, um, or varied, probably a better way of describing them, aromas, what's quite interesting in wine tasting versus spirits tasting, I find, is in spirits you're often told what, what botanical or Certainly with gin, you're told what botanicals have been used. So um, the, yeah, the way that gin is produced, you are actually infusing these botanicals. So we can, I can give you a list on each and I can never do that normally. With, with wine tasting, I have to be offering you suggestions, but you'll be able to find lots of other things. Now, I have no doubt you'll be able to find other things that, that I'm suggesting this evening, but it's worth saying the things I'm going to tell you are in there were, were infused in there. So it's almost like I can't be wrong tonight, <laughs> but if you can't taste them, don't worry. Um, and if certainly if you can't smell them, don't worry. As I said, 
a lot of uh, it takes quite a while to get your head around spirits tasting um but if you enjoy them i think one of the main things is what's the dominant one or two uh coming out of each because that will give that will guide you i think better when you're choosing different gins in the future so i'll tell you what i'm going to do actually quickly before i go on to sharing that uh sorry before i go into sharing that particular gin and going into uh talking about that i'm just going to talk a little bit quickly about how to taste gin um one thing that you don't have to do and i don't encourage you to do is um when you so so there are some similarities to wine making and there are some major differences similarities are you'll see i've served it in a wine glass um it's a very very aromatic um spirit so so it's it makes sense to have a bit of oxygen touching but then to have something narrow a narrow um top of the glass now that's why gin is better served in a highball glass as well you want narrow because what you don't want to happen is okay i will say the exception is a gin martini but if you imagine a martini glass a lot of the aromas will escape um so you do really if you're tasting gin want to have it in something with a funnel funneled nose at the top now in terms of swirling totally fine really good idea um i know people that also warm it up slightly in their hands um i don't feel the need to personally but try it see if it makes a difference to you when you taste the gin when you put it in your mouth you don't need to to draw in air like you would with a wine in fact you're probably encouraged not to because what you'll do there is you'll have a bigger experience of alcohol and when i first started spirits tasting I found it really hard to leave the idea that it was very alcoholic at the door um, what you don't want to do as well is overly, when you taste a wine, you sort of go, and then you come back to it and you keep going. What you don't want, you don't want to do that because you can go nose blind. Because of the amount of ethanol in here, what can actually happen is your nose will basically stop smelling things for a few seconds. So don't overdo it. Just have a couple of really lovely smells, but leave it at that. Um, when you do go to taste it, Turn it around your mouth. So roll it around. Make sure you coat all the sides of your mouth. You'll get the best experience if you cover all those taste receptors. But like I said, don't uh, don't breathe in uh, like you would with a wine. And then obviously swallow it if you'd like to. Or um, I'm going to be spitting mine into a spittoon because if there's one thing I do know for sure, it's that gin tastings can get pretty raucous. <laughs> so <laughs> if you want me to be able to speak for the next half an hour, I'm definitely going to be spitting out my gin, which isn't something I'd normally do. So this gin, let me get that back up again. This gin is from a producer called the East London Liquor Company. And East London Liquor Company is, um, oh, just before we start, somebody has asked about diluting with water. Um, you can, I, I personally wouldn't. Um, gin's already been diluted with water. Uh, we won't go into too much of the technicals today, but it starts life as a much, much higher ABV spirit. And the producer has has put it to a point where the dilution with water is where they think it should be, which is why you get some variation in ABV alcohol by volume on gins. Um, so I wouldn't personally. Um, I know you might with whiskey and I think I would with a whiskey, um, but I, I wouldn't with a gin. It's completely up to you. It is subjective. But no, I think for me, um, I would keep it as is. Um, so, yes, East London Liquor Company. Quite a new company um based near victoria park we did an event with them a few years ago which was fantastic they have a, a a courtyard and a bar and then behind the bar behind this glass panel here are all their stills and i'll show you some pictures um of actually sadly not their stills um but they're beautiful beautiful copper stills um behind the bar and you can go and do a tour there and a tasting as well and they've got a lovely tasting room in the basement so i do encourage you if you're ever in london or you live in london you have opportunity to go it's good fun there and um, they've only been open for six years only been producing for six years but the nice thing about gin is you can start quickly it's not like whiskey that needs aging there are some aged gins we'll mention a couple um, of styles that are generally aged later um or can be aged but most gin isn't and therefore production can be really quick you can start a gin business if you've got the capital nice and quickly uh far more quickly than wine and far far more quickly than things like whiskey so yes uh i'm going to read you out if it's all right the the flavor profile here because uh i want you to sort of see if you can spot any of them um i'm going to read them out in the order that 
if it's not the order that they write them on the website, I'm going to read them in the order that I I pick them up, and then maybe you'll do, agree or disagree. Um, but juniper berries, yes. So that piney, um, you know, that sounds bad, but almost like a car freshener, but in a really lovely way. That pine uh, pine needle aroma, and then I get lemon and pink grapefruit for sure. It's really lemony to me. It's really lovely and fresh. Cuba berries, that one I mentioned that looks like pepper, but it's actually more eucalyptus and lemon. Those are my real three main ones. I do then get coriander seeds. So I do, I mentioned as well, the, the lemon and sage notes um, of coriander seeds. So absolutely. Angelica root. I wouldn't necessarily call it musky, but we did discuss how angelica root is really good at, at bringing them all together. And then cardamom. I don't get too much cardamom in here. I don't get that sort of earthy spice that cardamom can bring but if you do write it in the chat I'd love to hear um I'm gonna have a taste but but do bear in mind if you are tasting along leave the alcohol at the door try and just get the aromas I'm not going to keep smelling too much so I don't go nose blind It's so lovely and fresh. I really wanted to start with this gin because it is a really, really good example for me of what a London dry gin should taste like. I saw a, I saw a question pop up about what London and um, London dry means. And I'm going to go on to that um, in the next little break between, between um, our gins. It's important really um, to know that London dry doesn't have a specific flavour. I think that's the key. London dry doesn't have a flavour, although juniper should always be the majority of a London dry. <clears throat> but I do associate um, a kind of lovely um, freshness with London dry gin. And, and this has it in spades. It's really, really aromatic. It's really refreshing. This for me is, is my, this is a summer gin and tonic. It's really classic. Um, lemony juniper that sort of I've seen somebody say they're getting the sage as well which I really like so that's great um but you want to just serve this lovely cold um bit of bit of tonic water and uh and a slice of lemon and I think that's really all you'd need I love it I always have loved it it's a real favorite of mine and, and I'm glad other people I saw somebody even before I'd we'd started the tasting saying they were enjoying it so I'm very glad um, I'm going to quickly talk about uh, distillation or less about distillation, really, and more about how the um, how the flavors get in into the gym. So um, effectively, this if you think of it as, as a sort of flavor infusion, I remember when I first started in um, drinks because I actually didn't just start exclusively in wine, although that's my specialty now. I was actually more in spirits when I came into the drinks trade. And I remember really early on somebody saying something like, um, oh, well, gin is just uh, flavoured vodka. And I thought, well, that doesn't make sense, because then how does flavoured vodka exist? Um, now, gin is really a neutral spirit that has been infused with flavours. And the way that that infusing happens is what makes gin gin. And the um, or a lot of gins gin, I should be specific, um, but also the, that juniper part is really important it does need to have or it should have juniper as a um, main component but by all means it needs to be definitely have a, a juniper note otherwise it's not not gin so there is one way which is just infusing uh, with essences and that's called a compound gin actually not very easy to come by um, these are not redistilled most gins we drink are redistilled so those compound gins um this was about to be really mean. They're not really things that you necessarily buy very easily in retail and definitely not from, from a wine. Um, you know, it's, it, it's essences, it's cheaper, it's more affordable. Um, there's a lot less work that goes into it because it's not this redistillation process. The two other types of um, redistilled uh, processes are by a pot, which I've already mentioned, but I'm going to go into a bit more in a minute, or a column. So there's two different types of still. Um, I'm going to show you first. This is a lot of juniper berries, by the way, going into a still. I thought it was important to see bulk juniper. Um, these are pot stills. And aren't they the most beautiful things ever? 
I love them. They've got what they call the swan neck. Um, sometimes you'll see them with a slightly different design. Um, you often see the design of the of um, the stills on gin websites because it's often something people are very proud of. Um, this is the, the method I mentioned earlier, which is that really early 18th century production method. They're really common for quality gin. Um, in the olden days, what they would do is you would take fermented grain mash, so probably barley more often than not, and you'd cook it in these pots um, along with in the main chamber. So you'd have um, you'd have your mash uh, and your water. You'd heat it. And because ethanol has a lower boiling point, when the vapor rises, um, essentially it goes up through the channel and it redistills and it cools down the swan's neck or down the neck anyway into a condenser. So you basically... Um, yeah, you're, you're distilling in literally the sense of the word, taking a bigger liquid and then into a smaller one. Pot stills are, um, they are very effective, but you have to do everything in a batch. So you imagine you put everything in, you do the cooking. Uh, the first bit is not very good. The last bit is not very good. You take the middle section, which is good. Um, and you do sort of a batch. So for example, the London dry gin that we've just had, this is actually a hybrid. So it uses both, but we won't go into hybrid stills today. But if you imagine the initial distillation of, of the East London liquor gin that we've just tasted uses one of these and it makes 600 bottles per distillation. And then you have to clean everything out and then you have to start again. And, and that's how a lot of gins are produced, but it is kind of a a labor intensive process because you're constantly emptying and then putting back in and et cetera, et cetera. Um, in terms of the base, base spirit, it can be um, grain, it can be sugar, um, rarely, I would say, um, grapes, like the gym we're about to try in a second. So it needs to be plant based uh, matter or mash at the bottom. You can't just throw any old thing in there. So as long as it derived originally from a plant, that's what you put in the bottom. So quickly, I'm conscious of time because we want to get onto the next one. And then, uh, yeah, we'll, and then we've got lovely number three as well. And um, so those ones on the right, in, well, it is a column still, but you can see very clearly on the right why they're so obviously column stills, because they have all those little, what I always think look like submarine holes. <laughs> I don't know why. Um, I always think it's sort of a wrong way around long submarine. Um, but these work in a different way. And these were invented later than the pot still. Uh, the most famous of these was invented uh, by a gentleman called Coffee, and he's got the still named after him. Essentially, these are continuous. So you can constantly pump your liquid through here. And each one of those uh, levels is a different fraction. And it's basically like lots of different little pot stills constantly going over the top of each other if you think about it like that so you just dis, you distill and then you go up a level you distill the heat rises you go up a level now what that tends to do is um it produces a gin that's slightly lighter in flavor if you imagine it's being redistilled fractionally or continuously um but it's very pure and very clean so you're losing some of the um the funkier flavors and you just constantly get to almost like improve it a little on the next round so I mentioned hybrid. I'll really quickly explain. Well, I won't explain, explain, but the the one, the gin I've just uh, talked about, the East London liquor, starts life in a pot still. And then they put it few, through, pardon me, a few fractions of a column to clean it up, you know, make it a bit purer and cleaner. And that is a very pure, clean gin that we tasted. So, so uh, not surprised. Um, but pot stills, still, those original ones are just hark back to them. They tend to be made out of copper, which is really good for the flavors um, and, and the distillation process. And these actually are the ones that are tended to be used in, in um, boutique gym production um, a lot, a lot. And it's certainly, um, yeah, somebody said, aren't those stills in a whiskey distillery? Yes, they are. But um, it's the best picture example of, of gin and whiskey are made using the same still process. So you'll find a lot of whiskey producers use their stills to produce gin and that's their cash flow so uh, I can't confirm or deny what liquid is in there it could easily be a gin but um, I think it probably is well it could be either actually so you may well be right but um, it you can use whiskey stills to make gin and lots of people lots of people do 
But the clever people uh, here at Henners have decided to take their um, English sparkling wine byproduct or their what might have been waste. Um, a lot of producers of, of wine, once they've pressed their grapes, they might put it into, uh, well, you can do all sorts of things with it. You can mulch it and put it back in the vineyard. Uh, you can biomass it, biofuel. Um, clever people at Henna's decided, hey, we basically have something to use for the mash, to use for, for um, the distillation as the, as the main base product. So they teamed up with a gentleman called Dr. John Walters, who designed a uh, copper pot alembic still for them, which is a very special still s- specifically for this um, distillery. And they work with a Brutonu winemaker called Samantha Bailey. And uh, she's the sort of master blender at Henner's. And then he's the master distiller. And they use grapes from their Pinot Noir, Chardonnay and Pinot Meunier vineyards that have already been pressed. We've made the wine out of them, the sparkling wines down in East Sussex. And then we're going to infuse that distilled mash with some botanicals. So let's have a taste. Yes, um, the answer to that question, Anna, is the base material is the pom- pomace, exactly that. So the base material that they're using here is what would be left over from the process of um, pressing the vines. And you get like a hard brick of very, very dense grape skins. Um, and that's exactly it. So I'm going to tell you, I'm going to do it again. And I'm going to list, list off to you what is in this. And I'm hoping that you will spot some really key differences because there's one that really stands out to me. So juniper, yes, there is juniper here and it's lovely. Um, Coriander, yes. I actually find this less of the lemony and a bit more of the sagey. And I don't, that was terrible English. And I don't know whether to tell me in the chat members if you agree or disagree, but I think I'm being led towards sage because of the other big thing in this, which for me is parsley. So they put parsley in here and cucumber. And for me, I just get a lot of, and they have specified curly leaf parsley. And I went into the garden earlier because we've got a bit of curly leaf parsley that has survived the frost in our, in our little herb bed. And I went and had a bit and I thought, oh my goodness, yes. It's got that sort of really light herbaceous, not, um, you know, it's, it's that sort of freshly mown grass almost for me. Um, they then final, finally for the kick, they call it the citrus kick, add some pink grapefruit peel. And again, I'm getting more grapefruit than I did in the last. I think the grapefruit stands out in the one before I got lemon and grapefruit and it just felt overall very citrusy. But here I'm definitely getting some that herbaceous, freshly cut, freshly cut grass, all of those things. So. Oh, lovely. Um, it's so I also I've done exactly what I said I shouldn't do and I'm going in a few times but the third time I just went in then I got the cucumber at the end and it was really lovely and really really refreshing Um, yeah I'm getting the cucumber now how lovely so Dennis is saying he's getting lots of herby notes as well I'm really pleased. It's um, it's an unusual gin, um, but cucumber is becoming so trendy. I'll talk to you about who sort of spearheaded that movement in a moment. But cucumber and gin is becoming incredibly popular. So um, look out for it more and more. You might see it on the back of labels. But here it doesn't play the main role for me. It plays a supporting act, but a really beautifully well done supporting act. Right. I'm going to quickly tell you about styles of gin. Um, Now, if you would like me to, uh, please let me know tomorrow and I will send you the presentation. But I will also gladly send you the the types of gin um, written out. I can type them out because um, I'm going to go through it quite quickly. But if you're looking at a bottle of gin and you don't know what to expect, these are the key terms. And then that's what you'll, you'll get in the bottle. So Oh, I haven't tasted this gin. What is wrong with me? I'm going to taste it. Sorry. I was so blown away by the smells. <laughs> Pardon me, members. I got too excited about the cucumber. I'll have a quick taste now. Mm. 
Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. Parsley, parsley, parsley. Um, really herby, really green. Um, very refreshing. I'll just stop my share quickly and then I'll come back on in a moment. But one thing um, that I've seen two serving suggestions for Henna's. And uh, one serving suggestion said lemon, and I think that would be nice. Another serving suggestion said mint and uh, cucumber. And I think that would be really delicious with this. I'm getting the cucumber. The cucumber is actually much like the nose coming at the end, um, whereas at the beginning it started with parsley. I've also got a really nice integration of alcohol. And this is actually 5% more than the last. Um, but I certainly don't feel like the alcohol is burny, burny. It's a really lovely, mellow um, flavor. So let me know what you think, members, if you're tasting this one. I know that Mahesh is. He, uh, he's had, I think he might be on his second glass this evening, he told me, so <laughs> of, of henna's and tonics. So if you are tasting it and it's your first time in particular, do let me know because I think it's a really interesting gin. So I apologize for missing the tasting element there. Types of gin. Um, we were going to go left to right and then I made a little last minute change on the pictures, but I've given you a picture example of each of them as well. Um, Jennifer, we've spoken about the original gin king of gins um geneva is however um quite different in terms of style so in it's often malt distilled but you wouldn't necessarily taste that but it is usually made sweet so um the sweetness is is a, just a very very different style if you're used to drinking london dry which i'll go on to in a minute um it's also quite hard to find geneva um, there are a couple of producers in the UK. We don't stock one. Um, this particular producer is a famous Dutch producer. Um, I think there's a producer called Bol, if they're still around. Um, they certainly were a couple of years ago. Um, but they they produce um, a beautiful uh, Geneva. Old Tom, um, that's also sweeter. And Old Tom, there's a lovely story about an Old Tom cat during the gin craze. And it was something to do with if the cat was outside, the gym was ready or something like that. But it's it's called Old Tom. Um, and again, because if you imagine this is the one that came from Geneva, it's also in a sweeter style. This is actually increasing in popularity because it's really, really good in cocktails. So whilst it's an old, older fashion style, um, it's now becoming really quite popular. And if you like a bit more sweetness and if the, these gins one and two were too dry for you, i.e. no sugar, then Old Tom is a really good alternative. Bathtub. Now, this is one of those compound gins where it's just infused. So um, this comes from the Prohibition era. A lot of, you'll find a lot of gin names. Of, uh, they do what they say on the tin. So this, uh, is, this involves cold compounding. So you put spices and botanicals, et cetera, into the base spirit. And it comes from uh, when it was illegal to make um, alcohol and Americans would distill spirits in their bathtub, um, basically, and make hooch during the prohibition. So um, bathtub gin. Plymouth gin, and this is where I flip them around and I apologize on the photo. So Plymouth gin is the pretty obvious one that says Plymouth gin. It was an IGP. So it wasn't a, a geographically protected um, indication. So that has actually since expired. So you can make Plymouth gin everywhere. Um, it's really popular at the moment. And I did see a member earlier saying they were drinking Plymouth and it was their favorite. It's slightly sweeter and often fruitier than London Dry. So again, it's got a bit more sugar to it, um, but not as much as a Geneva and usually not as much as an Old Tom either. Um, London Dry Gin, however, does not mean it's made in London. It happens to be that we had one made in London, but the other one made in East Sussex is not, uh, but it's called a London Dry. London Dry basically needs to be redistilled. So you need to use one of those pots, copper or um, column. You can't put it in a cold compound. The predominant flavour must be juniper. Now, that's where I think people bend the rules because I have had a lot of London dry gin that does not predominantly taste of juniper. The term gin can be supplemented by dry, but you can just call it a London gin. But London dry tends to mean zero, very, very low sugars. But you actually aren't allowed to add sugar to London dry. So you know that you're what you're getting. You're also not allowed to add artificial flavours. So it has to be the real deal. Um, and the minimum strength of London dry is 37.5%. So um, one quick gin versus distilled gin is that gin doesn't need to have that redistillation process. Distilled gin does. Although I have just told you if it says London dry gin on it, 
automatically has to be distilled. But you might see, um, if you do see just on a bottle distilled gin, that's just giving you the indication that it's been distilled as opposed to a cold compound gin, um, which they just tend to have slightly finer flavours. But to be honest, bathtub gin's delicious. They just tend to be a bit more bulky and, and um, robust. <laughs> So last but not least, let's go on to gin based liquors. Um, now we have a gin based liquor here. Slow gin is probably, I would argue, one of the only things in the world of uh, wine and spirits that gets around EU regulations more uh, in a more sort of friendly way. Uh, PIMS, for example, it's not allowed to say it's a gin-based liquor. Well, sorry, it has to say it's a gin-based liquor, and that's what it is. Slow gin is not actually a million miles off PIMS um, in terms of how it's made. But it's, yes, it's technically not a gin. It's gin-based, and then it's had lots of stuff added to it. That means that technically it's no longer a gin. But you can legally use the term slow gin without the liquor suffix, suffix when you make to a certain quality level. And if, if you meet those approved points, then you can call it slow gin. So it's a bit of a misnomer. Um, I make my own slow gin sometimes, which is really good fun. Um, I encourage you, it's one of the easiest things in the world to make. I do encourage you to, to produce some, but I make the fatal error, to be honest, of usually using the cheapest gin I could find. The good thing about people that know what they're doing, like slow motion, is they don't. And they've used a really top quality gin that they've produced. And it was when they were going around picking things and farming, they said, why don't we use the slows as well? So it's much easier, I find, to taste slow gin. Um, I don't know about anybody else, but for me, the smells are really, really overpowering. Um, and it's very, very sweet on the nose. And I find it a little bit hard to pick out the smells, but the flavours I find easier. The alcohol is also lower. So anybody who's um, tasting this, they won't perhaps find it as hard to, to leave the alcohol at the door, like I mentioned. Um, so the flavours in this, or the aromatics before it started, the addition of the slow, were juniper, which is good news, um, coriander, we've spoken about already, the lemony sage, angelica, oris, so those lovely things that tie everything together, bay, and then also six things from the farm. So they use things like crab apple and rose hip elderflower, nettles, wildflowers. Um, and I think that's a really lovely thing to do. It makes for a very, very, you'll notice all of these gins are British, but I feel like they've all got a different British identity. We had the urban London sort of clean cut, modern gin at the beginning. We then had a gin using English grapes that had, uh, you know, that kind of fresh grass. Um, and now we've gone on to an English gin that smells like running through a mulberry bush kind of thing um because obviously then once they've once they've had all of those elderflowers and nettles etc they've then taken hedgerow slows and they've handpicked those um and i won't go into the process of making slow gin with you but if you're interested it's very easy to look up on the internet um and then they've added sugar lots of sugar and then that draws all of the juice out of the fruit um in terms of what flavours you're going to get, rich, dark, aromatic fruits, so things like cherry, um, you might get a touch of almond, they've suggested as well. Um, the thing I find, like I mentioned, it's much easier to taste on the palate. So let's give the palate a go as well, because I think one thing you might find is I always love that slow gin has, it's almost like a, a currant sauce. You know, when you have a red currant jelly or something and you have the sweetness, but also that sharp kick. Um, and that's what makes it so good with your food. I find with slow gin that it really does that. So um, you should still get tasting. You should still be able to taste a little bit of the juniper. But remember, those slows are really going to bring a lot of flavor as well. So if you are tasting any slow gin this evening, give it a go. Mm. Oh, yeah, it's a jammy dodger. <laughs> Um, it's really lovely. You get the juniper. It's it's almost creamy. It's so velvety and luscious and unctuous. Um, it's got that touch of alcohol to warm you, but you, you don't feel that it's too alcoholic. Um, it's big. It's bold. Sugar on slow gin always makes my lips sticky as well. It's just such a lovely feeling. Um, 
so yeah I, I have to say I I love a slow gin definitely different um drinking times and I wouldn't personally put tonic with slow gin personal preference but I I prefer slow gin by itself that's um how I would like to drink it it also makes a really good cocktail when mixed with a nice sparkling wine um but to be honest they also work probably better independently but if you're feeling like you want to make a cocktail then why not it's a really really good one we had it over Christmas it's um sugar and booze added to booze so it's a bit lethal but it's delicious um so let me know what you thought of that I'd be really keen to know if anybody is um is tasting along with that one today it's from Yorkshire it's um yeah it's just a gorgeous kind of celebration of all things British that one um in my personal opinion and it's low stock so get it whilst you can I don't think slow gin should just be for Christmas but unfortunately I think that's kind of where the market is and we tend to drink it at Christmas time but it's great sorry it's great all year round so I'm just going to, I promised, I know I've got a minute over already, but I did promise at the beginning I was going to give you three big brands and tell you um, what the key components of those are. Again, I can send it in an email if you're interested and don't get a chance to write it down. Just let me know. Um, but I've written it down here to share with you. Uh, so Gordon's, if you're a Gordon's fan, Juniper, yes. Angelica Root, good binder. Coriander, Licorice, Orange Bitters and Oris, and they don't actually specify, but I assume it's Oris Root, uh, which is the, the iris bulb root I mentioned. Um, Bombay Sapphire, Juniper again, Lemon Peel, Coriander, Cassia, Oris, you'll see a bit of a theme there, uh, quite similar to the, the Gordons, but here is where it's a little more different. They have almonds in Bombay Sapphire, uh, but they also have licorice like Gordons as well. And if you are a Hendrix fan, and I know lots and lots of people are, uh, Hendrix was what I mentioned earlier, which is the original sort of cucumber. They really led on cucumber. And the reason I've got this slide up is, is if you've been in a bar and you've got cucumber uh, served, in your, served in your gin and tonic, it was really Hendrix that, that broke the mold that because one of their main botanicals is cucumber. They actually, in the list, write it first before even juniper. Um, it's also quite floral. So rose, um, cubeb berries, the ones I mentioned earlier, caraway seeds, chamomile, elderflower, yellow, yarrow berries, orange, lemon, angelica root, orris fruit, uh, and then the big cucumber. So um, that's why you get served cucumber in your gin tonic sometimes, because Hendrix went around telling everyone we've got cucumber as our main botanical and serve it with cucumber. So there we go. So oh, that's a, a, it was a lot to digest and I apologize. I did try and answer as many questions that I saw coming through as I could. Um, so hopefully that's, that's fulfilled your gin appetite. Um, I love to hear about new gins in particular. So if you have a favorite, it doesn't have to be a wine society gin. If you have a favorite, I would love, love, love for you to uh, send me what that is. I love exploring new gins. Um, and if you have liked, disliked, have an opinion on any of the gins this evening as well, I would really love to hear those. So whew, apologies, we did go three minutes over, um, but there was a lot to get through. We went through, we tried to do a whole category. Um, the only question that we've got in the Q&A, which I'll quickly round off with, is what tonic do you recommend? I do remember you said Slimline. Slimline is just if you're really tasting the gin. My husband hates Slimline. I like it. I feel like I can taste more of the gin. He really doesn't like it. He thinks it can be quite thin. He, he feels the texture of it. Um, so I don't have a preference. Um, in terms of tonic, there's quite a few good ones now. Um, and everybody's stepped up their tonic game. Um, I think yeah there's uh, Fentimans is lovely um and then yeah there, there's absolutely loads your standard Schweppes tonic is really really decent as well I think one of the things is um yeah 1724 tonic really is fantastic that's great um lots of new boutique tonics have come into the market I think if you like your gin a lot it's worth getting a tonic um of quality if you can you know sort of supermarket owned labels don't really cut the mustard in my opinion but uh what i would say is make it a decent ish tonic but also experiment with flavors so if you do like more aromatic you know bitters and things 
use aromatic tonic. There's a lovely um, fever tree Mediterranean tonic that I really enjoy with a gin called Gin Mare, which has uh, sort of olives and, and basil and is very herbaceous and, and um, well, it's, it's Mediterranean, lots of the flavours. So I find that goes really well with the Mediterranean gin. Um, from um, fever tree so I would say it might be a bit of trial and error don't don't just stick to one tonic and think that's um, one size fits all because it doesn't but obviously I know that we don't all have space to have loads of different tonics in the house so if you find a brand that you like um, buying a slimline and a regular or an aromatic if you like it etc is a really good idea one thing I tend not to buy are things where it's sort of a, a pepper you know when it's actually a flavored tonic um, because often you're sort of destroying the point of trying to taste the gin if you've bought a pink pepper tonic that is going to just decimate all of the other flavors so yes I personally um I would I would steer clear of the overly flavored ones but things like your aromatics and your mediterraneans are nice so um without further ado um I'm going to bid you all farewell and hopefully let you enjoy another couple of glasses of uh, gin and tonic, to uh, tonic by itself, gin, whatever you fancy. Yes, I'll send the presentation around, but I will do so if you ask me. I won't send it as standard. Yes, there'll be a recording of this. It will be on our YouTube channel. And yes, if you have any other questions, then please um, do send them across. I am actually on annual leave for a week as of tomorrow, but I will endeavour to answer any questions when I get back. And I will get the PowerPoint sent ready to lovely Maria so that she can send it out to you during the course of the week. Have a lovely evening, everyone. Thank you, Mahesh, as always, for behind the scenes. Um, yeah, have a lovely evening. I will see some of you hopefully next week for our intro, uh, Beginner's Guide to Wine. Uh, but if not, hopefully you'll join another Sip Size event. We've got Alsace coming up two weeks today. So hopefully see you then. Thank you all. Bye.